Good evening. I'm Mark Updegrove, the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation, and welcome to the second episode of our six-part series, The Path to Racial Equity. A year ago, I had the great good fortune of meeting Leslie Wingo, the president and CEO of Sanders Wingo, who I'm now honored to call my friend and colleague. Our friendship began as we talked about the issue of race. Those conversations developed into further discussions around ways that we could engage the community in working toward creating positive change toward racial equity. We asked ourselves, what practical, simple steps can we all take toward greater racial understanding and equality? The injustice we saw last summer made our quest all the more urgent. Though we certainly didn't have all the answers, we knew experts and organizations that we knew could help. That led to the creation of the path for, to racial equity, an unprecedented partnership of over 20 nonprofit organizations exploring different aspects of racial equity. Leslie and I are grateful to our partners for coming together to make this happen. Tonight, we'll ask, how did we get here? Which, in which Leslie will explore the subject with our friend, Dr. Peniel Joseph. Leslie will give Peniel a proper introduction in a moment, but I will tell you that Peniel's latest book has practically won every award under the sun. And I would just ask my friend Peniel, if you could just save certain literary awards for other writers, I would be deeply grateful. Let's get started. It is my great honor to introduce my friends, Leslie Wingo and Dr. Peniel Joseph. Good evening. Peniel, it's so good to see you, but for the audience and for those people who have not met, have, who have not had the honor of meeting you yet, I just wanted to share a little bit about you. Mr., I'm sorry, Dr. Peniel Joseph is the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and, and Political Values at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and Professor of History and the founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the University of Texas at Austin. As Mark alluded to in his introduction, he has written several books on African-American history, including Stokely, A Life. His most recent book, The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. is a Time Magazine 100 must read books of 2020, best book of the year list in The Guardian, Times Literary Supplement, Financial Times, Penn American Biogra Biography Award long list. I have been so excited about this conversation. You would have thought my, my, you know, my mom is excited for this conversation. We're all very excited to talk to you and, and welcome you to the series, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Leslie. It's such a pleasure to talk with you, uh, who I consider a great friend and colleague. Thank you. So before we get started, I just wanted to take a few minutes to revisit the historic moments we've all recently experienced and seen. For me, I've been captivated by social media, the, in the images of inauguration, but more specifically, how everything has changed in the matter of four years from COVID, the obvious heavy policing at the inauguration, and to the past administration doing away with traditions associated with a peaceful transfer of power. So I'm curious for you as a human being and also an historian, how are you reflecting on the recent events? You know, I'm I'm writing, uh, Leslie. <laughs> I'm writing about <laughs> this uh, now as we speak. So I have, uh, you know, hopefully a book that'll be out in 2022 about this this not just this past year, but really I've been saying um, on 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 radio and television uh, and these events that we've we've organized at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and other places that we're we're really experiencing America's third Reconstruction. Um, and, and I don't say that um, hyperbolically. I really do believe that this period uh, from around the election of Barack Obama in 2008, um, all the way up until um, not just the insurrection that we saw this year at the Capitol, but really the extraordinary watershed election of uh, Raphael Warnock uh, to the Georgia Senate, John Ossoff to the Georgia Senate, the work of Stacey Abrams, uh, Longhorn Hookham, Stacey Abrams, <laughs> uh, and, and Black women uh, and, and Black Lives Matter. But, but then of course, the three Wednesdays of, of insurrection, uh, impeachment and inauguration, um, hugely, hugely important. And when we think about reconstruction, reconstruction is that period in American history that in a lot of ways encapsulates our origin story, that period from 1865 
1896, where there was this literal and figurative reconstruction of American democracy. So we're thinking about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, uh, uh, voting rights, at least for Black men, but Black women organizing alongside of them. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about Ida B. Wells, Francis Harper, uh, organizing uh, church groups, creating schools, creating civic and religious and political infrastructures. But then paralleling that is this resurgence of white supremacy. Uh, it's the rise of not just the Klan, but, but physical violence and racial terror in places like Texas, Memphis, New Orleans. Racial pogroms happened between 1865 and the end of the century. Now we know about Tulsa and Atlanta and the early 20th century white riots. But we, we never talk about 1898 and Wilmington, North Carolina, and how an inter, interracial government was actually uh, murderously displaced uh, by, by a mob that had talked about uh, fraudulence and, and said this wasn't fair, that, that you had these black people and these white people who were in political power. So in a lot of ways, this period encapsulates both that first reconstruction where you saw a, a voting rights, uh, side by side with a convict lease system. You saw black people create businesses side by side with sharecropping and peonage. So you saw so the best of times and the worst of times in one period. And then of course the second reconstruction, we sometimes call it the civil rights movement, but in fact, that period of 19, between 1954 and the Supreme Court Brown desegregation decision and 1968, Dr. King's assassination, we think of it as the heroic period of the civil rights movement, but it's really a part of America's second reconstruction, which starts ironically in the context of the Great Depression and the Second World War. So there's really a, a, about a 25, 30 year period where there's these debates and these, these efforts to get anti-lynching legislation. And you've got black women like Mary McLeod Bethune, who's part of, of Roosevelt's black cabinet, FDR's black cabinet. You've got uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who's really one of the most extraordinary figures of the 20th century, who's an anti-racist, who's trying to push FDR. Um, you've got, even before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Ella Baker and Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois and Claudia Jones and these black women and men who are, who, who, are, who are bleeding for democracy, both overseas and domestically in the United States. Sometimes we call it the long civil rights movement. And so when we think about this period, this period from Barack Obama all the way up until uh, the age of Trump and the Proud Boys and Black Lives Matter uh, and, and, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Stacey Abrams uh, uh, and, and, you know, um, Andrea Gorman and, and all these different people, this is America's third reconstruction. And so we're, we're not used to striking juxtapositions because we don't think historically, but reconstruction is filled with striking juxtapositions. You, you can look at certain aspects of both the first, second and this current reconstruction and say, we're fine, racial progress has been achieved. Look at these first, <laughs> these incredible victories. But then you can look at, um, uh, the reaction and the response. Sometimes we boil this down to one word, backlash. We can see this racial, political, economic, cultural backlash uh, against the very idea of black dignity and citizenship. So we're experiencing all of that at once. Uh, and I think that's why so many of us have whiplash over the events of the last four years and really just the events of the last several weeks. So let me ask you another question. When I look back on the summer protests of 2020 and then the riot uh, that happened January 6, both groups impassioned about their beliefs. Some would even say both groups were outraged, but it's been argued that law enforcement prepared differently for the protest summer 2020 than they did just a couple of weeks ago. So my question from you and from your view is, why was everything so different and how did race play a role in, in some of the de decisions that were made? Well, law enforcement absolutely did prepare differently for uh, the, the MAGA marchers and what became this, this white insurrection, this, this white riot, really this white supremacist assault on the US Capitol. Uh, you know, this goes back to reconstruction as well, because when we think about reconstruction and really the period of antebellum slavery, we don't really have formal police departments in the United States nationally until after the end of racial slavery. And really one of the first um, ways we use law enforcement in the United States 
was in the context of looking at black people, human beings as contraband, as this species of property that needed to be brought back to their rightful owners, right? And so when we think about after the Civil War, black people should be citizens on equal footing with whites, no more, but no less than, than, than their white counterparts. And what you see is a convict lease system created. We actually create, after the Civil War, the first quality of life crimes in the United States, where you can be arrested and fined and incarcerated uh, for lacking employment, for loafing, for, for being considered uh, just not doing much of anything, right? And, and that's gonna be targeted to black people. And at the same time, we make virtually any white American citizen can actually uh, do a citizen's arrest of a black person, but the reverse is not true. So there's a really long history with the way in which law enforcement has been organized to look at black people as um, dangerous, as criminals, as something that needs to be contained uh, and incarcerated, punished. So by the time you have Black Lives Matter activists coming out there, uh, even though when we think about this summer, we saw uh, millions of white, white Americans on the side of BLM, uh, law enforcement's gonna look upon that as a threat that they just don't look at MAGA marchers as that threat. And I think what was extraordinary about the president, President Biden's inaugural address is he talked about white supremacy. He talked about domestic terrorism and white supremacists as domestic terrorists. So the FBI law enforcement has very much been um, um, hesitant to look at white supremacists and white hate groups as a threat to democracy. But I think January 6th of this year uh, has forever changed that. What are your thoughts and takeaways from the incredible moments in history? No, I thought President Biden delivered an extraordinary inaugural address. I thought it was the best inaugural speech since John F. Kennedy's uh, New Frontier speech uh, in January of 1961. Um, I have some, some uh, words here in terms of what he said that I thought was really important. He talked about the winter of peril and possibility. Um, he said, much to repair, much to restore, much to heal, much to build, and much to gain. Um, so interesting. He says, a cry for racial justice some 400 years in the making moves us. The dream of justice for all will be deferred no longer. Um, and now a rise in political extremism, white supremacy, domestic terrorism that we must confront and we will defeat. So I thought that this was an extraordinary speech. It's the first time a US president has utilized the term white supremacy uh, in his inaugural address. Uh, it's really the first time um, that we see a president centering racial justice as being um, really the beating heart of American democracy. And so I think that when we think about this president who, who quoted from Lincoln, 1863, he talked about my whole soul is in it. Um, in terms of restoration. He said at the start of his inaugural address that this is a day for democracy. His election was a victory for democracy. He talked about the violence in the shadow of the Capitol, the desecration of the citadel of American democracy on January 6, 2020, 21. So it, it's really an extraordinary speech. It's an extraordinary speech. I think that it's a speech that called us to national unity, but it called us to national unity um, through provocation. And the mm -hmm. provocation uh, is really this idea of molding consensus. That's what true leaders do. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said that vanity asks, uh, is it popular? But conscience asks, uh, is it right? And when we think about Joe Biden, that was a speech, President Biden, um, that really was uh, based in his conscience. He talked about Kamala Harris, the first uh, female and black and South Asian vice president uh, in American history. And he, he, he used her uh, as part of these striking juxtapositions that we've seen uh, this year and this last several years uh, during this, this American reconstruction, this third reconstruction. He used Kamala Harris really as a point of optimism to say that things can change. But at the same time, he talked about a cry for racial justice 400 years in the making. So what I thought was extraordinary about President Biden's speech was just the very fact that 
um, to mold consensus, he was telling the nation what it needed to hear, not what it wanted to hear. And that's what true leadership is. It's telling uh, Americans of all backgrounds, all ideological stripes, um, what we need to hear, not what we want to hear, uh, so we can get to the real deep work of democracy that needs to be done. And I thought he did such an amazing job wrapping that all together. And so what, I'm wanna, what I'd am what like for us to talk about during discussion today is how did we get to this moment? You know, you've talked about the third American reconstruction that is both multicultural and multiracial. And, and we've talked about looking at this through three different channels, education, organization, and agitation. So for our audience, will you tell us about the third American reconstruction, the origin of its name? Can you tell us how we got to this moment because it didn't happen overnight. And in this, this society that we are in now, the sugar rush of what things quickly, I, I, I think it would be great if we could just kind of unpack that a little bit. Yes, certainly. What I mean by the third American reconstruction is really this period between the election of Barack Obama uh, and now we're really experiencing it. And what, what that period um, echoes is the period of the first reconstruction after racial slavery, where we saw the end of slavery with the 13th Amendment, birthright citizenship with the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment provided um, political suffrage for black men, even though uh, white and black women vociferously argued that they be included, but they were defeated. White women were defeated for another 50 years and black women were defeated until the passage of the voting rights on August 6, 1965 under the Lyndon Johnson administration. So when we think about this period of the first reconstruction, you see voting and political rights uh, for African-American communities, the rise of historically black colleges and universities, the rise of a whole new political class, a Freedmen's Bureau, healthcare, churches, a whole civic and political structure being set up. Uh, the historian Stephen Hahn has called it a nation under our feet. You see it rising up during Reconstruction. Paralleling that is going to be white anti-Black violence, this political backlash. So in a lot of ways, the first Reconstruction sets the template for the second Reconstruction and our current Reconstruction. The second Reconstruction is the, is the Civil Rights Movement, but really the Civil Rights Movement starting in the 1940s, all the way up until the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And you see these striking juxtapositions, political and civil rights at times for African-Americans, all kinds of racial firsts, Thurgood Marshall becoming the first Supreme, Black Supreme Court justice, but you also see um, urban rebellions and riots, you see civil disorder, you see political assassinations, you see a, a new rise in white political backlash when we think about the rise of George Wallace, uh, 13 million popular votes running as a segregationist. So it's really these extraordinary juxtapositions where on one hand, we feel as a nation, wow, we've made these breakthroughs, whether it's Marian Anderson, we see this person, Oprah Winfrey, we see uh, uh, Cheryl and Eiffel, we see all these different people doing extraordinary things, but then we see alongside of that backlash. And when we think about the third reconstruction, Barack Obama is an incredible starting point for us because Obama becoming the first president of the United States who's black, uh, Michelle Obama being this extraordinarily brilliant first lady you look at that and you think to yourself, we are post-racial, we've made it, we've overcome. People were in tears in Grant <laughs> Park. Uh, and, 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 and then it's followed up by Tea Party, a birther movement that really pre, is the, is the, it presages QAnon, the birther movement saying that the president of the United States was not born in Hawaii, but was born in Kenya and he's a fraud and we, we otherized him. And then the person who popularized that fraud, Donald Trump becomes the next president and defeats Hillary Clinton, right? Um, and alongside that, you saw the rise of Black Lives Matter 1.0, 2013, 2014, after the deaths of Trayvon Martin, uh, after the deaths of Michael Brown and Sandra Bland and, and these, these radical, Black women, Black feminists, uh, queer Black feminists arguing mm -hmm. for intersectional justice. So you've got the rise of Obama, the rise of a political backlash against Obama, you've got the rise of Trumpism, and then in 2020, all these forces come together with Black Lives Matter 2.0, the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial disparities therein, the most politically and racially divisive presidential election in American history. 
And then finally, um, um, the rise of this anti-racist majority, 81 million Americans who come out from all backgrounds, from all different ideological perspectives, from all geographical perspectives, and they vote for Biden and Harris and they vote for hope. And then you see sort of the punctuation of that on January 5th, uh, 2021 with Reverend Raphael Warnock and Reverend Warnock becoming the first black senator from Georgia is extraordinary. He, reside, he presides over the pulpit, Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, where the young Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, plied his trade. So we would not have the first black uh, senator from Georgia without Dr. King and Warnock's campaign um, helped lift the 33-year-old Jewish American, uh, John Ossoff, into the Senate as well. And those two victories have given the Democratic Party this slim majority uh, in the Senate. So really extraordinary times. And then the day after that, you get the, U the insurrection uh, uh, on, on the US Capitol. So these striking juxtapositions are really part of um, this historical pattern that we have. Whenever we're trying to focus on black citizenship and dignity, we make at once both simultaneous, simultaneously almost it seems, great strides and, and we have this huge backlash, right? Um, and that's what we're trying to figure out this time. But this, this vision and version of reconstruction is not over yet. And what we're trying to achieve for the first time in American history is black citizenship and dignity. And if that happens, that means the defeat of the racial caste system. And that's gonna to reverberate to every single American of all colors, of all genders, of all backgrounds. So from where I sit, it feels like the, there's this tenor in these conversations about how do we heal and reconciliation? How do we move forward? However, also bundled in this conversation is its expectation from some folks to have very quick solution to very complex problems. So what we wanna make sure we give the audience something, we wanna give them just key takeaways of how they can engage in this valuable work and not do the thing that drives a lot of us crazy, the diversity box, you know, check the box for solutions and cheat talk. So how do we get folks in action around this idea uh, and expectation and education? Yeah, you know, I, I wrote something uh, calling for a national racial uh, truth, justice and healing uh, commission at the executive level. And really what I wanna discuss is how we can make that happen just even at the local level. And I think when you think about truth, you're talking about education. Uh, when you think about um, justice, uh, you're talking about organizing and policy. Uh, when you think about healing, um, I think healing is connected to agitation actually. I think that you, you, to heal, you, you, you still need to agitate. You have to agitate both the body politic, but networks and communities. So I'd say the, the, the first thing we need to do is educate ourselves. And I think this has been the last year uh, because of the COVID pandemic, because of the George Floyd protests, we've seen a lot of discussion about anti-racism. We've seen a lot of discussion about the roots of our, our, our divisions in the United States. We've seen a lot of discussions about Juneteenth and how did we get here? I think we all need to educate ourselves on the basics of American history. I think we need to, you know, African-American history is American history. We need to educate ourselves on the basics of that history in a panoramic way. We need to understand what happened uh, in the United States and how that continues to impact us today. We need to understand it, not just vis-a-vis -vis, uh, lynching, but vis-a-vis -vis voting rights and voter suppression, vis-a-vis -vis sexism and violence against black women that continues up until this day, even when we think about poor maternal health outcomes yeah. for black women, including right here in Austin. We need to think about this history, uh, this deep history vis-a-vis -vis the criminal justice system and why the criminal justice system continues to mete out unequal justice uh, towards the African-American community. The, the, the latest incident is not just police violence against people like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, but the disparate treatment of Black Lives Matter protesters in contrast to violent white insurrectionists at the US Capitol who were virtually all allowed to go home. And those who were initially arrested were only arrested for violating a curfew and not for destroying the nation's capital. 
right? So we, we need a deep history. And I think once we're armed with that history and we're on the same page, and this is the debates between the 1619 project versus the 1776 commission, telling the truth about American history doesn't mean we don't love America. Telling the truth about American history means that we do love America. Dr. King loved America enough so that he could criticize the country, right? So this idea that patriotism means lying about the nation's origins in racial slavery. That means lying about how we've treated women or immigrants uh, or Japanese internment camps or lying about the deep-seated nature of racism, anti-Semitism in this country. That's not patriotism. The real call for all of us is to say, we are a country that has been flawed, that has been unequal, that aspires towards racial justice. And if we can make those aspirations, turn those words, those lofty words into deeds, we are gonna finally achieve the country we've all wanted. So education is a big, big key. And I would say this, Leslie, with that education, we can leverage that education in the networks that we have just locally, right here in Austin. Every single person who is listening to our conversation can leverage that in their school districts. They can leverage it in their churches, their synagogues, their mosques. Yes, you can push City Hall. Yes, you can push University of Texas at Austin, but wherever you are at, you can leverage that story. And if people aren't talking about racial justice, you say, well, why aren't you talking about it? And here are some resources I can give you, whether you're interested in environmental justice, women's, women's rights, uh, issues of, of, of food justice, issues of housing affordability, all of it is centered around racial inequality here in our United States. So that's the first part. The second part in terms of organizing is what can we do? All these nonprofits here uh, in Austin, how can we communicate better, consolidate what we're doing mm -hmm. so we can share information and help each other, lend our expertise to each other, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of reinventing the wheel, if we all come together and we share in trying to get more resources and get more um, um, uh, 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 policies and resources for the anti-racism and the social justice politics that we all have, we're gonna be much better off. And then finally, that healing part is hugely important. We need to speak to each other. There's, Austin is one of the most segregated cities in the country. Um, Texas is a segregated state. The United States is still wounded by racial segregation in public schools and in all of our neighborhoods. We have to have to um, um, come together as one nation. And part of that is that education, uh, the organizing, but then the healing and the racial rapprochement is gonna say, we're gonna, we're gonna move beyond ourselves, empathize with people who don't look like us, empathize with people who don't have the same background as us. And that's what Dr. King asked us to do. He asked us to enlarge in our moral circle. So let me let me ask you this or tell you. So last week we kicked off our series with the CEO of Courageous Conversation, your friend Glenn Singleton. And during that conversation, Glenn said something that was profound to me. And he said, sometimes mistakes are part of the victory. And for me, I define mistakes as something that is big and just lofty, something you may just screw up, but at least you tried it, right? And, and maybe you missed the mark, but that's okay. And as you look through the history of the American of of the of United States, and and I also ask you to be a moment in this moment just for a little bit a futurist. What what mistakes should we make to be victorious as we move through the as we move through these things? And I and you outlined some of them with organization and education, but what are some of these these big lofty mistakes that we need to keep trying to make? Well, I think I think we need to be innovative, and I think we need to do um, an above. Uh, uh, all, all the above strategy. So I think that we need to understand that we can, we can do, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can, we can want rapprochement and healing, and we can organize uh, for anti-racist policies, and we can actually transform the narrative of racial justice in America simultaneously. Right? Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we say one has to precede the other, but I think we have to. Right now, 
move with speed, with all, you know, with all deliberate speed in the, in the most positive sense of that phrase um, towards racial justice and centering uh, racial justice uh, for all people. But I would say this, I think Dr. King showed us that we could talk about the universal, but King wanted us to talk about the universal through the particular struggle and lens of black people. So I will say that the organizing principle of the racial caste system right here in the United States is anti-blackness. And we need to really push back and defeat that. I think last year was extraordinary because you saw so many black people uh, and black women at the forefront and people saying amplify the voices of, of black women, women like yourself, women like uh, uh, Dr. Burnett at Houston Tillotson, who's the president of Houston Tillotson. There's so many different extraordinary uh, black folks right here uh, in, in Austin and Texas and nationally. And we're seeing them get much more leverage and amplification uh, in really important ways. And I, I think we do have to lead with that. I think we have to lead with saying black citizenship and dignity is going to reverberate out to um, Latinx and to Asian and South Asian and to indigenous uh, Native American and through, 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 to, to poor whites and, and whites who are, who are interested in, in human rights for all people and anti-racism. So I think we do have to lead there in a way, I'd say that the, the mistake it, in, in quotes where he says mistakes, sometimes people make an argument that so-called, uh, and I know Leslie, you've heard this, identity politics are a mistake. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, one of my my intellectual heroes, Barbara Ransby, uh, who's a historian, has a wonderful book of uh, the making of, of Black Lives Matter. And she's written a wonderful biography of Ella Baker. She really articulates how I so-called identity politics, radical black feminists talking about intersectional justice, that phrase from Kimberly Crenshaw, the mm -hmm. black feminist legal theorist. Um, is actually the most universal notion of identity because it's saying that people who are black and who are queer uh, and people who are not able-bodied, we need to look at the world through their lens, that politics, that race, that class impacts all of us differently. And we've seen that with the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So what I've learned from black feminism um, as one of the critical lenses that I see the world through is this, this idea that identity politics are not the narrow uh, vision and lens that they're often accused of being. It, they're actually very, very wide and capacious. The problem is for too often, we've made the case that objectivity is actually what is, what is white, what is male, what is patriarchal, what is heteronormative, cisgendered, we say that that is the objective lens, right? <laughs> so the people who actually um, took um, and pulled the wool over the Wizard of Oz and said, here's, you know, here's how, how politics and race and gender really work ha have been in a lot of ways, um, black radical activists, black fe radical feminist activists. And I think we should push this idea of black citizenship and dignity, even if we get pushback against it. So we have about two minutes left before we go into Q and A, but I want to sh ask you one last quick question and it's around agitation. And I know that you and I both have a love for Star Wars and Yoda and that we could debate baby Yoda, Papa Yoda all, all day long, but baby Yoda, I mean, big Yoda, old Yoda. He has this quote, do, do or do not, there is no try. So what is the one thing that we can do beyond, do and go beyond to support initiatives? What actions truly make a difference for our audience? I think the biggest thing everybody should do is put resources into local anti-racist uh, black led organizations, wherever they are. And those resources should be a combination of financial, your own time, your own prestige, your own networks, your own energy. All of us have a supply chain of power and privilege we're connected to uh, and some misery and grief, right? And we want to connect ourselves to our power, po our power and prestige to this, this anti-racist struggle. So everyone can do it. So that's looking at nonprofits, for-profits, uh, boards. Um, it's every, it's from stem to root. And if we do that, you're gonna have made an, a massive, massive impact. Sometimes it's just lending your expertise. You walk in there, you say, I wanna help you. I've been a CEO, I've been a CFO, I've, I've been a consultant. I've, I've 
I understand uh, how to use skills that I don't understand this topic, but I can use my skills to help you amplify your voice. You do that. Uh, th those are, you know, Bobby Kennedy talked about ripples of hope, uh, the great Bobby Kennedy. And if we can all be those ripples of hope, in addition to all the structured politics that, of course, we're going to be a part of, uh, we're going to make big, big headway uh, in, in terms of building that beloved community. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What we're going to do now is we're going to move into our Q&A portion. And I have a question. I was, I was talking to a group today. And one of the things that they have said is, let me start this differently. One of my favorite sayings is people hate two things, change in the way things are. <laughs> and so they, they want to know change and progress is hard to measure. How do we actually cause change? And then how do we know, how do we measure it? How do we know that we've done something meaningful? That's a great question, Leslie. We're going to know through outcomes. I am a big believer in President Lyndon Johnson's Howard University address. Uh, and in that address uh, in 1965, uh, he, in June of 1965, he addressed, uh, he gave the commencement address at Howard University, which is, of course, uh, the new vice president, <laughs> Vice President <laughs> Harris, her alma mater. And she's an AKA, part of the Divine Nine. Shout out to the Divine Nine. Um, and he talked about in that speech, he said, you know, uh, it's not just about equality of opportunity, it's equality of outcomes. He said you couldn't um, start a race between two runners and have one who'd been shackled for centuries and then just say, go ahead and, and you guys, you or you people are now uh, in a fair competition. So we're going to know, people have asked me this, how do you know you're making a difference? Well, we have the data and every we're accumulating more data in Austin, but every single city as part of the Racial uh, Truth, Justice and Reconciliation uh, Commission should be keeping racial data, not just about COVID-19. They should be re keeping racial data about the tech center, racial data about wealth accumulation, income inequality. Um, residential and public school segregation, racial data about who's on the board of trustees at the University of Texas, um, um, uh, every single institution, for-profit, non-profit that we have, health outcomes, criminal justice system. And we're going to know if the changes that we're doing are going to be effective when that data starts becoming positive, where Black people are not going to be disproportionately overrepresented in negative social economic indicators and disproportionately underrepresented in positive social economic indicators. So once we see that, we know we're trending the right way, right? And so we, we're, racism is about outcomes. It's not just opportunity, it's about outcomes because if we think to ourselves and empathize with other people, and we don't think to ourselves, there's one group of people by race who's working harder than the other, or one group of people because of race who's smarter or just thriftier than the other, better in math and science, and this group is better in athletics, right? If we get away from that eugenicism, that scientific and cultural racism, then we're gonna say every child uh, has um, pot equal potential. And if we cultivate that potential, then we shouldn't see wide disparities in terms of outcomes. So that's when we'll know. So someone, we're getting a lot of questions coming in right now, but one of the questions is, is what can we do to help the third reconstruction continue? I'm a, I am a parent of an almost eight year old, so am I. <laughs> and <laughs> what can, should I teach her and what can we do? You know, that's a great question. Um, what we have to do is be active citizens and that goes beyond just voting. We have to, um, one, in our own family environments, yes, teach our, our children. You should teach your children. I've got a kindergartner and, you know, we're, we're, we're discussing, we discuss race, we discuss um, civil rights, we discuss the president of the United States, the constitution, being an American, being a global citizen all the time. So. One, um, educate all day, every day, right? Uh, uh, infuse your child with intellectual curiosity about everything, but most of all about justice, about humanity, about equality, right? Um, two, uh, in terms of to keep the third reconstruction going, 
you know, we have to um, talk about uh, racial justice and achieving that beloved community that's free of racial injustice, free of economic injustice, that is based on intersectional justice all the time. We cannot afford any kind of racial or social justice fatigue and say, next year, we're gonna talk about something else. <laughs> this, is, this, this is the center of our lives uh, and it's gonna be a marathon. This is not a 100 yard dash, this is a marathon. Um, and then finally, you know, to keep this going, um, we have to work on ourselves inter internally. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about was a revolution of values. That revolution of values meant that all of us were gonna have to enlarge in our moral circle. But what that means is this, we need to set up a world where if somebody's child is in ICE detention uh, and they're a non-citizen, that that hurts us so much that we are called to action, right? It's our moral circle can't be, Dr. King argued, only as big as our own biological children, our own, um, our own kin, our own blood relations, or even our own, as big as our own chosen family. It can't be 20 or 30 or 40 special people. And after that, you, you turn off and you're numb to violence or oppression happening to those people. Our moral circle has to be as big as this planet and include, uh, it includes the animals, it includes the environment, it includes the plants, and of course, human beings. So we have to work on ourselves. And if we do that, this is gonna be an ongoing reconstruction that doesn't just have a beginning, a middle and an end, that we continue um, um, this really, really important task of, of reimagining American democracy. And if we do that, we're gonna reimagine how human beings relate to each other. Uh, and we're not gonna see the kind of suffering normalized that we see in our everyday lives. Our next question is, can systematic racism be truly addressed without inclusion of voices of marginalized persons? What about LGBTQIA? Will, will there be recognition within the subcultures of marginalized groups who face significantly more discrimination? I'd say absolutely yes. This is where I'm always very impressed with the Black Lives Matter movement. I would encourage everyone to check out their their policy agenda, because it's a comprehensive policy agenda that really centers um, the rights of immigrants, uh, including Spanish speaking immigrants and, and black immigrants, uh, LGBTQIA and those who are differently uh, able, uh, differently able bodied and um, differently abled, non able bodied. Um, it, 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 it centers black women, it centers the cash poor HIV positive, um, it centers queer folks. Um, and it says that, you know, when we center these folks, we're setting up a, 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 a paradigm, a framework that's going to reverberate and impact all of us. You know, it doesn't mean that um, um, by centering uh, folks who are LGBTQIA, that straight people are somehow going to be marginalized. It's, it's actually quite the opposite. It's saying we're setting up um, and destroying structures and systems of domination where we can all achieve our full human potential. Uh, so it's really, really striking in that way. And this is where I say about this idea of intersectional justice and identity politics, saying that we all need uh, to have the state recognize our particular and pe peculiar circumstances. And if that sounds um, too narrow, just think of the way in which we've been able to recognize as a society the very particular and peculiar circumstances of the rich it, to the point that we have very specific tax breaks for the rich and the super wealthy and say, look, you can get a tax break if you make even a part of your home uh, a public art museum for one day a week uh, because you want a tax break on this $50 million worth of art you have. So we, we, can, we can be very granular at a, as a society, depending on who the target of that generosity is. All I'm calling for, I've got nothing against uh, the rich. I'm calling for everyone to have that access. That's what I'm saying. So we, can, we can actually make the policies that show and recognize our own individual humanity uh, 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 in a way that, that produces what? Equity and justice for all people. So we already have the blueprint. We just need to expand it to more people. Uh, we have time for probably two more questions, but here's one. What role can Latinx people play in the fight against racism and anti-Blackness? 
You know, I think they can make a big role. Um, they can play a big role. It's really about, um, one, there's Afro-Latinx folks who are part of the yeah. Black Lives Matter movement. They forcefully identify. They're from everywhere, from Central America to Latin America to South America to Haiti and Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. So there's that. But those who are non-African identifying Latinx, I think they have to push back against the, the own, um, their own anti-Black racism that they've imbibed from their culture, whether that's parts of Mexico and what Mexico does with uh, anti-Blackness and Black dolls and caricatures of Black people, caricatures of Indigenous people in Mexico as well. Uh, but, but really, Latin America, Central America, uh, Europe, when we think about Spain, there, there, there is a lot of, there's a massive current of anti-Blackness. So I would say it's about one, identifying and finding out about that history, finding out about the history between Latinx folks and people who are black and histories of colonialism that are times shared, shared histories. At times it's really more of a master slave dialectic with the Latinx folks being on top and the black people being on the bottom. So there's a lot of education there. Um, and I would ask, uh, implore Latinx folks, people to try to identify with social justice, because if you identify with social justice and human rights, you're not gonna fall prey um, to, to the politics of white supremacy that have encapsulated some people of color, as we've seen with some white hate groups, having folks who are Latinx uh, and, and sort of proudly siding yeah. Uh, with 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 these hate groups, so that that's been unfortunate. But I think it's a lack of education and knowledge and understanding of our history and the shared symmetry uh, that that Black and Latin Latinx folks have in common in terms of in terms of resisting oppression in the United States and globally. Uh, what are some go to resources for accurate U.S. history, Black history, other must read books? resources and that you might recommend? Oh, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a ton. I mean, um, we're gonna give you some, some CSRD, Center for the Study of Race and Democracy links and, and things. Darlene Clark Hines, The African-American Odyssey, it's two volumes. Uh, it's a great book to check out um, that goes from really the 15th century and African uh, uh, kingdoms all the way up to the present. So it starts with, with uh, Africa uh, before the transatlantic slave trade, because it's important for us to understand that we were on the African continent before being in the Caribbean, before being in the United States, before being in Brazil. Um, there's also, of course, John Hope Franklin with Elizabeth uh, uh, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's um, From Slavery to Freedom that has been updated. Um, there's great work by uh, Nell Irvin Painter on African-American history and connecting African-American history with art as well. Um, uh, certainly you could read uh, Ibram Kendi and Jason uh, Reynolds Stamped, which is a, a, a book about anti-racism for young adults and sort of a remix of Ibram Kendi's National Book Award winning Stamp from the Beginning. And that's a big, big book that I, I teach Stamp from the Beginning. Um, so there's really extraordinary um, number of books on African-American history. Some of them are behind me right here um, that I would recommend. Frederick Douglass, I'd recommend Mm -hmm. um, uh, Brittany Cooper's uh, book on Black feminism, Tressie McMillan Cottom's book uh, on, called Thick and Other Essays, which was a National uh, Book Award finalist. Um, so there's a number of different books. I think we are in a renaissance of uh, an age of African-American history. Um, so I, I would say that there's a lot to read and, and there's, there's resources that we'll be providing as well. So here is our last question for you of the evening. And this person writes, as someone who has worked in public history, I know, there, I know that there can be a lot of pushback when folks, mostly white folks, have the history that they've grown up with challenged and when it's obviously wrong. When do we improve Americans' understanding of history when there is so much structural and individual resistance to it? That's where the federal government can really play a role because I think that the 1619 project, New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning project, Nicole Hannah Jones is really uh, one of the, the, the real geniuses of our, of our age. That's a multimedia project uh, that really looked at the supply chain of racial slavery, power and privilege for right, whites, grief and misery for blacks from 1619 to the present. And even if you just look at the narrative from 1776 to the present, 
we are not teaching the way in which racial slavery helped build up US and global capitalism. There's great books, Sven Becker, Empire of Cotton, uh, Craig Wilder, Ebony and Ivy, um, uh, Dinah Ramey Berry, um, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh. Uh, there's so many great books um, on, on racial slavery, uh, Tacky's Rebellion, uh, Vincent Brown, um, Stoney the Road, uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. But what's, what we're not doing is saying, Black people built up Wall Street. Black people built up the railroad. Black people didn't just build up the plantation economy of the South. They, build it, they built up the, the, the North and the West Coast too because it relied on racial slavery uh, and the exploitation of Black labor and even uh, insurance policies on Black bodies to, to, to make up this exchange rate of capital, right? It's part of these supply chains of power and privilege versus misery and grief. And telling our students and young people that story is not going to destroy the Republic. It's not gonna make people uh, hate American, uh, America and American democracy. It's gonna give us all a better understanding, a shared understanding of where we're from. And that story of course is gonna include Latinx folks. Of course it's gonna include indigenous folks. Of course it's gonna include all of us, right? And so I think that a national racial uh, Truth, Justice, and Healing Commission could go a long way towards providing um, at least carrots, no sticks, but carrots for school districts who want that history to be to be told. Because remember, the, the, the extraordinary part about American education, it's really left up to states and local districts. What the federal government does, starting with Lyndon Johnson, 1965 Elementary Secondary Education School Act, is provide billions of dollars in grants, right? Uh, for, for local districts. But there's a way we can, again, have an incentivized approach to say, let's, share, let's give us a, a bigger understanding of our history. The, the highest form of patriotism is understanding both the grandeur and the travails of American democracy. That is the highest form of patriotism. So we do have these shining moments and we saw it yesterday. Uh, Andrea Gorman, we do have Oprah Winfrey, we have Michelle Obama, Barack mm -hmm. Obama, but, but we have to tell those stories alongside of Breonna Taylor. You know, it, it, it disrespects Breonna Taylor's legacy. It, it, we, 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 we desecrate the legacy of the many thousands gone, the millions gone who suffered and they didn't get to be first lady of the United States. They might've been qualified. They might've been uh, brilliant enough to be that, but, but, but they didn't get the chance because of our rougher history of, of, of racism and white supremacy in this country. So I do think that there's a way for more of us to get on the same page. We will never all be on the same page. That's the beauty of democracy. That's the beauty of democracy. We have to understand it's not group think, but what happens with democracy, you know what you produce? Consensus, you mold consensus, but we mold consensus through peaceful uh, nonviolent struggle in democracy. Sometimes there's been violence, of course, but when we think about Martin Luther King Jr., when we think about the women's movement, when we think about LGBTQIA, a lot of it was molding consensus really through, through suffering, through being incarcerated, through being abused and oppressed all the way up until you know, Seneca Falls and all the way up until Selma, all the way up until Stonewall and other places where we finally said, you know what, these people are our people <laughs> instead of saying that they were these people. And that's what one day we're gonna get to a point where instead of looking at Tulsa and looking at all these different things that happen to Native Americans, that happen to women, instead of saying, how could we do that to them? First of all, instead of lying about it and, and acting like we didn't do anything, right? But instead of even saying, how could we do that to them? And thinking that's em empathy and empathetic. We're gonna say, how could we have done that to us? That's what we're gonna yeah. say. How could we have done that to us? When we get to that point, there's no them or us, we're not gonna do and engage in that kind of behavior ever again. Peniel, you are such a joy and a pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank so you. Dr. Joseph, thank you so much. Many thanks to each of you and our supporters, the incredible team at Sanders Wingo and the LBJ Foundation, and of course, Austin PDBS. And Peniel, the, the way you structured how we got here through education, organization and agitation, um, just brilliant. So no, please. Thank you so much. Thank please. you, Mark Up the Grove, LBJ Foundation, Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, uh, the LBJ School and da Dean David Springer. Thank you everyone who, who helped make this happen. 
Um, it's so exciting. And I'm, I'm so happy and proud to be here in Austin. We're, we're doing amazing things. And I hope to be able to say we have modeled how to build the beloved community for other cities around the country and around the world. And with that, have a wonderful evening. Stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Good night. <laughs>